Today, we are going to be chatting about atopic dermatitis, a prevalent and often debilitating skin condition commonly known as eczema. To discuss this topic in detail, I'm extremely honored to host Dr. Emma Gutman, a leading authority in the field of atopic dermatitis. Dr. Gutman currently serves as the chair of the Department of Dermatology at Mount Sinai, and her groundbreaking research is redefining our understanding of this prevalent skin disorder. Her work focuses on developing new biomarkers for atopic dermatitis and exploring targeted therapeutics that could revolutionize treatment options. She has made important discoveries concerning the immunologic basis of the disease, thus enriching the scientific understanding of its pathophysiology. Her pioneering research is currently examining multiple targeted therapeutics that aim at Th2, Th22, Th17, IL-23 axis, offering hope for countless sufferers of atopic dermatitis. So Dr. Gottman, Super excited to be chatting with you today. Welcome. And obviously, if I miss anything, feel free to fill it in. Um, and thank you for being here. Sure, my pleasure. Excited to be here with you. Dr. Gutman, could you please provide a brief overview of what atopic dermatitis or eczema is and why it's a significant concern in dermatology today? Sure. So, you know, atopic dermatitis has multiple flavors. Flavors, like I like to call it. Uh, for some patients, it just means a little bit dry skin, itchy skin, not that bothersome, um, uh, particularly when they have not so extensive body surface area involved. But for some patients, it's highly uh, bothersome with multiple areas involved, uh, oozing, you know, extremely itchy, uh, it bothers their sleep, their performance at school, at work, uh, and so on. So um, we have patients with mild disease uh, and a more limited involvement, but we have also many patients that have a moderate to severe disease, and that's really debilitating and really interferes with uh, all the aspects of their life. And with that being said, I'm not taking away from those with more limited disease because you can have two lesions, but they are very bothersome, you know, and keep you up at night and so on. Yeah. You know, I heard that I always thought this was like a really interesting um, fact about atopic dermatitis that it keeps children up at night because they're scratching and itchy that it could actually lead to um, problems at school or with learning because they're not getting enough adequate sleep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So you're in the forefront of research in the field. How have things evolved in understanding the pathogenesis and the treatment of the chronic condition? Yeah, so atopic dermatitis treatments really uh, evolved since I started my career in atopic dermatitis. And at that time, I think there was still the debate whether it's a barrier disease or an immune disease. And, you know, it's a debate that it's a little bit futile uh, because at the end they work together. And now we know that we need to target the immune molecules to really make a difference in this disease. And then the barrier uh, defect um, um, hopefully will normalize. Um, there were some trials with um, agents targeting primarily the barrier and they failed. So that's not working primarily. Maybe it will work in the future for prevention, but not for primary treatment. Um, so um, I think for a while we did not have good treatments, particularly that we didn't know what is the primary cause. You know, when you do not know, pharma companies didn't know if they should go after the barrier or the immune abnormalities. But once it became evident that you have to target the immune abnormalities and which ones, now uh, we have better and better treatments. Uh, we have some that already are approved, some more specific, some a little bit more broad and more are coming, both uh, biologics that are injectables and a uh, systemic um, um, oral molecules. And also in the topical realm, we now have amazing new topicals that also are coming into the field. So uh, our patients and our physicians will have options, which is amazing. Yes. And you mentioned biologic. So at what point do you initiate biologic therapy and what kind of patients require them? Yeah. So, you know, I usually know which patient is a candidate for systemics, not necessarily for biologics, but 
the patient that is a candidate for systemic is a patient that trial topicals topicals did not uh, alleviate their concerns, um, did not bring better sleep, better functioning, and still they have extensive body surface areas involved. So that will be a candidate for systemic medication for me. And then I have a discussion with the patient to see what they want to do. If they want to go for a biologic, an injection, or a small molecule, a, an oral medication, you know, each one has their pluses, their minuses, and it's always a discussion with the patient. Are there any diseases that you should avoid initiating biologic therapy in, and how do you manage a patient like that? Yes, yeah, so fortunately, the biologics we have in atopic dermatitis right now are super safe. Uh, they also may largely do not interact with other drugs, so we can definitely initiate them. We even can initiate them in children, um, and um, that's important because a large portion of our patient population are children. For example, myself, even though I'm not a pediatric dermatologist, I do see about a third of my patient population is pediatric, so... Uh, many children and in children we think a million times right if we should put a patient on the drug uh, or not so we definitely need a systemic um, treatment that is very safe um, uh, in children and in adults we always try for for safety um, but no there are no contraindications of initiating it um, and um, it's patient preference what they want to do could you tell us a little bit more about what is coming in the pipeline, um, including the JAK inhibitors, um, yeah. abrocitinib and upadacitinib? Um, I actually just wrote a paper on JAK inhibitors for atopic dermatitis. So I would love to hear um, from your point of view and because you have such in-depth research, what's coming? Of course. So, in, you know, atopic dermatitis is a heterogeneous disease that has a, a multiple phenotypes a, based on ethnicity, a, age, a, IgE, and others. And a, it is important a, to consider these when we put a patient on a drug, for example. And that's why also some patients may not respond enough to just targeting TH2 axis because, you know, sometimes you need to target more than one axis. And that's when the JAK inhibitors can come handy um, because they target several immune axes. Um, but, you know, it's important to talk to the patients, talk about the safety. So far, the safety in atopic dermatitis and in alopecia areata and other diseases that we use JAK inhibitors has been uh, very good. Uh, and a lot of the safety data that uh, uh, made the FDA place that a black box warning was actually from diseases like arthritis, right, where the patients are more obese. Um, it, it's a different patient profile. Uh, they are sicker. They have other um, comorbidities. So it's important to keep that in mind. But with that being said, right now we are dealing with a black box warning and our patients need to be very informed because you don't want to give them a prescription. Then they come home and they're like, oh, I got this prescription, but it has a black box warning. What does it mean? So I, you need to spend the time, explain to them. I think these are good drugs. They have their caveats. They have their limitations. And it's important that the patient is well informed and it takes an informed decision. Have you ever found that after explaining the black box warning to them and the risk for infection, mortality, malignancy, thrombosis, although all those things are obviously rare, have you ever found that they decide that they don't want to go forward with this medication? Yeah, once in a while it happens um, and it's important to go over everything. And it's also important to go over the idea in that in and in jack inhibitors that that's a plus that you can stop and restart them at any time right so it's not that you need to take them for life if at some point you want to put the patient on something else you can but, but right now for some patients particularly those that may not have responded enough to some biologics we don't have as many options so sometimes i tell them listen for now let's do this in the future we can find other treatments for you do you think we'll ever get to the point where, like, we know atopic dermatitis has a lot of variability amongst patients. Do you think we'll ever get to the point where we can either do a test or like a molecular test to like differentiate 
which patient would be more responsive to this biologic versus another biologic? I'm particularly passionate about this because that's a large focus of my lab. And yes, I do think that in the future, um, we'll have personalized medicine in dermatology in general, and maybe atopic dermatitis, and we'll be able to tell ahead of time, saving time for the patient and for the insurance company, saving money, uh, because right now it's trial and error. So I think that that should be our future goal, like in cancer. Yeah, and it's more selective. So usually if you're more selective, you get probably less side effects, I could imagine. Exactly. Do you think that racial backgrounds play a significant role in the treatment response and the outcomes of atopic derm? It plays some role. For example, Asians have higher T17 activation. Um, African-Americans also will have more like kinified lesions with more TH22 activation. So it's important to know these in, when we are thinking about patient treatments. So we know that like biologics are, as you mentioned, very costly to the insurance companies. Do you think that as more options come to market, as well as biosimilars, that this will drive the cost down and make treatments more accessible to more people? Definitely. I, I think eventually, a, up to a point, you know, it's expensive to manufacture biologics. There are a lot of a, arms involved, but maybe over time, a, we can have it a, cheaper, hopefully. And, you know, I've heard that, or I've also seen it, that if you put a patient on dupulumab, say, um, that their side effects could actually decrease over time. Mm -hmm. What is the physiology behind that? You would think, I think, I mean, is it obviously the immune response is changing over time? Yeah, so in... Usually, um, dupilumab doesn't have a really a side effect besides the eye manifestation. So we see the eye manifestation uh, in like, I would say, give or take 15% of the patients. The majority are milder. Uh, we do see also some uh, psoriasiform rashes or, or joint pain, uh, much more rare. Um, I wouldn't say they decrease over time. I would say that, in fact, some patients you'll have the psoriasiform rashes actually come later. What will disappear sometimes over time is the eye manifestations in, in sometimes. In, but yes, in, sometimes in, in, there are some changes. For example, the pyramid can change, in, you know, it's targeting TH2 and maybe the balance TH1, TH2 can change over time, leading potentially to the psoriasiform rashes. So you, you can have in, some changes over time. So I want to go back a little bit to your research because that's really where your passion is. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you're working on right now? And, you know, I mentioned earlier in your introduction about the different pathways where you're focused on. I would just love to hear more and share that with the audience. Yeah, so I'm very passionate about personalized dermatology and personalized medicine in general and finding the right target for the patient. My lab is involved in a, a lot of a, a phenotyping of patients a, depending on the phenotype and then understanding how different phenotypes may respond to different drugs, a, both in atopic dermatitis and recently also we are doing the same in alopecia areata, also a disease that I got interested by Alliance because a, it's a disease that has a lot of a, association to atopy. Uh, and also, uh, it seems that there are different phenotypes, the ones with atopy and alopecia areata and alopecia areata without atopy. And so we mentioned, you mentioned personalized medicine. How do you envision this? Yeah, so I envision a biomarkers that a, a can tell us which patient uh, may respond better to, to a drug. And maybe in the future, uh, this will become available, not only in a research lab like ours, but you know, for the general public, I can see how that may, may happen. And that will be like through a tape strip that you put on and you see how they respond? Yeah, ideally through something minimal invasive. So a tape strip, a blood assay. I, I don't see how this will be feasible through biopsies because you'll not be able to convince patients to do that. Yeah. Right. 
Are you concerned about any long-term consequences of being on biologics? Do you think we have enough data to really say whether they're safe or not? You know, that's a great a question. I think we learned from the psoriasis arena and already we have like a 10 year experience with the firma that um, biologics are safer than our previous immune suppressant medications like cyclosporin, methotrexate, imuran. So that's good news. Uh, of course, we need to gather long-term uh, safety data, but it seems that we are on a good path to much better safety compared to the older drugs. When you start a patient on biologics, do you tell them like, oh, you're going to be on this for six months or it, this is a lifetime medication? That's an excellent question. It's important to tell them that eczema is a chronic disease similar to psoriasis and other diseases because all of us would want a magic wand, you know, yes, <laughs> we touch you and nothing, uh, you'll have nothing in the future. But unfortunately, we are not there yet. I think there will be drugs that may switch the disease around, like I like to call it, but we are not yet there. And what's your take on biosimilars? You know, I mentioned it, they're starting to be used in psoriasis. What about their use in atopic derm? Right. In atopic derm, we fortunately or not fortunately, we don't have it yet. I heard from my colleagues in psoriasis that they are not always great. Sometimes they don't show the same efficacy like the original drug. So to be truthful, I'm a little bit worried about that. Um, and I heard it from quite a few of them. So we'll see. I'm not a great believer that they are exactly the same. I know they are cheaper, but likely they are not the same. Yeah, I mean, they're supposed to be very similar, a similar molecule, but obviously it can't be the exact replica of it. So we don't know if it can tweak things in the same way. I don't have experience myself, but I heard from my psoriasis colleagues that we're not so thrilled about some of them. So you recently assumed the role of the department, uh, the chair of the Department of Dermatology at Mount Sinai. How do you see your role impacting the field? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So, you know, um, I, I, I like to um, um, think that um, we need, I think it's very important to educate the next generation. I'm very passionate about that mentorship um, and um, mentorship both clinically and research. You know, not everybody needs to be uh, researchers. I think though people need to be exposed to cutting edge uh, technologies and cutting edge research, understand what it means and definitely be exposed to cutting edge treatments. So one thing that I'm very passionate about, my residents know that they're exposed to really cutting edge um, uh, treatments, the best treatments in the area and so on. And so that they can use it. Um, not always it's possible. Uh, imagine a resident that are, is in a residency program when these biologics or new molecules are not utilized. So it's hard for them to start utilizing it unless they do a really big effort. They go to some um, um, elective elsewhere. You know, if you don't feel in your hands that you are comfortable, you don't use it. I see that I get a lot of referrals from physicians, even young physicians that are not utilizing them because they don't feel comfortable. All right. You have to feel confident in order to prescribe it and talk about it exactly. and educate about it. Yeah. And exactly. lastly, what is the next big step in atopic dermatitis research and what can we look forward to in terms of treatment and understanding in the coming years? Because I know you play a very big role in this. So it's a great question. For me, I'm really excited about um, molecules that are potentially modifying the disease course, like, for example, the OX40 pathway seems to be such a uh, drugs. Uh, uh, there was a hint in phase two, the OX40 antagonist, that maybe when you stop them, uh, the disease doesn't come back for a while. Uh, so I think that's the next big step. Because patients at the end, like you mentioned, they want to stop the drugs at some point. They don't want a drug for life. So you believe with the OX40 pathway, it can actually alter the course of the condition, chronic condition? Hopefully. But I think that's the future, to find uh, targets that uh, we can target them and we'll get some disease-altering um, effect. Wow, that's very exciting. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Gutman, for joining us today on the Derm Club podcast. I enjoyed our discussion. The same. And good luck. Very nice to thank meet you. Thank you.
Bye bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Derm Club podcast. If you found the discussion today to be valuable, please subscribe and share. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode as we continue to delve into dermatology and skincare with the world experts.